Kindly remain standing for the national anthem. Thank you, you may be seated. Esteemed audience, for the last two decades, our first speaker has been dedicated to export promotion and economic development across the Caribbean. He recently ascended the corporate ladder to occupy the position of director of the Caribbean Export Development Agency, a role that will challenge him to bolster private sector growth and resilience through trade and investment initiatives. Please put your hands together and give a warm round of applause to Mr. Damie Sinanand as he comes to offer official welcome remarks. His Excellency, Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali, President of the Corporate Republic of Guyana and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, Chancellor Justice Yonet Cummings Edwards, Speaker of the National Assembly, Manzur Nadir, Attorney General Anil Nanlal, other distinguished ministers of government. Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General, CARICOM Secretariat. Ambassador Rene Van Nees, Ambassador and Head of the European Union Delegation to Guyana for Suriname with the responsibility for Aruba, Bonnet, Curaçao, Saba, St. Barthélemy, St. Eustace, and St. Martin. Other members of the Diplomatic Corps. Mr. Leland Nout, Deputy Executive Director, Caribbean Export Development Agency. Ms. Lisa Harding, Head, Private Sector, Caribbean Development Bank. Our Platinum Sponsors, Republic Bank Limited, USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, and of course, the Guyana Office for Investment. Other sponsors, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It is certainly an honor and privilege to extend a warm welcome for you all to this, the third iteration of the Caribbean Investment Forum held in the Caribbean region and the fourth iteration overall. We are so ecstatic to be here in Georgetown, Guyana, for what now has grown to become the Caribbean's premier investment facilitation event. When we conceived this event three years ago, we anticipated great things and we expected a lot, but I think the growth of this brand has exceeded even our wildest expectations. I am particularly grateful to His Excellency, President Irfan Ali, and his wonderful team for so readily agreeing to partner with us on this flagship initiative under the theme, Transforming Our Future, Empowering Growth. On a personal note, this represents my maiden address as Executive Director of Caribbean Export Development Agency, having been appointed to this post on July the 1st, after serving with Caribbean Export for the past 10 years. In my previous role, I was effectively in charge of planning and executing the CIF, down to the, down to the finest detail, so it was certainly fitting and certainly very special to me that my highly capable team has taken over the planning of this and my first address as executive director is representing the agency at this event. Under my leadership, I plan to work closely with our partners to continue to support the region's private sector to build resilience and competitiveness and export and investment growth through accelerating their green transition and adopting innovative business pra practices and new and exciting technologies. My vision is to transform Caribbean export into the leading project execution agency for private sector development in the region with the Caribbean Investment Forum continuing to play a key role in achieving our vision and our mandate. I would like to acknowledge our long-standing partnership with the European Union who continuously, gen who continuously and support the mandate of the agency. We recently signed a Euro 
$12 million regional private sector development program under their new Global Gateway Initiative. This program, which Caribbean Export will implement over the next four years, focuses on business development and export promotion. And I'm sure we will hear more from Ambassador Van Nies shortly on this important regional private sector initiative. We also acknowledge and appreciate CARICOM and the Caribbean Development Bank for their enduring partnership since the inception of this event. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barnett and Lisa, your team at Caribbean Development Bank. The Caribbean Investment Forum symbolizes a remarkable shift in our collective approach to securing the vital investments required for economic development and diversification of our cherished Caribbean region. The Caribbean is ripe for investment opportunities across various sectors, and the forum provides the platform to enable various public and private stakeholders to meet and advance this cause. Our inaugural event in Port of Spain in November 2022 attracted over 500 attendees from 46 countries around the world, including all 15 members of CARICOM and the Dominican Republic, what we call the CARIFORUM states. And a vast majority of them, over 95%, were private sector firms. We also had similar results for our second forum held in Nassau, Bahamas in October 2023 with over 500 attendees, 40 plus vetted investors from 42 countries around the world. But of course, we know success is not just measured by the amount of people in the room, because if it was, this would be a very highly successful event. We are also starting to see successes materialize with several projects securing investments. And you will hear about these results during our program, our investment villages, and our blitzes over the next two days. And I'd like to recognize our colleagues from the Connect Caribbean project who was able to secure investment through partnerships with, de developed through the Caribbean Investment Forum. As our region continues to fortify its resilience against external shocks, it is paramount that we never lose sight of the pivotal role played by the private sector in transforming lives and forging more robust economies. No longer can we sustain economic growth by relying solely on our domestic spaces. We must look beyond borders and embrace regional and international partnerships. We must come together as a single Caribbean to bring the required scale and market size needed to attract the high level of capital investment needed to achieve transformational growth. In other words, it can't be business as usual. We must act with alacrity in unity while embracing the ever-changing environment. I know that sounds scary, but it's certainly very necessary. The Caribbean Investment Forum therefore continues to provide an invaluable opportunity for Caribbean private and public stakeholders to maximize their potential in developing the essential relationships that can revolutionize the Caribbean region. It is a platform where business and foreign investors engage directly for fostering an environment of mutual benefit. Underpinning this is our broader plan to deepen trade and investment relations, encouraging the flow of economic activity within our region and towards international partners. But what should be our focus? The Caribbean region is often celebrated for its breathtaking beaches, vibrant ecosystems, vibrant cultures, and rich history. But what we have to understand and what we have to make foreign investors understand is we offer more than just sun, sea, and sand and a picturesque escape. In recent years, the Caribbean has demonstrated its resilience and ability to adapt and rebound when faced with new challenges. We are forced to acknowledge the fact that global economic, political, and social landscapes are continuously changing when discussing the economic growth and sustainability of the Caribbean. Our region faces unique challenges, none clearer than the deleterious climactic event such as Hurricane Beryl, which one week ago devastated our neighboring islands of Grenada, Petit Martinique, and Cariacou. We were supposed to have the Honorable Minister Karine James, who is the Minister of, Digital um, of Green Economy Transition in Grenada. Unfortunately, due to the hurricane, she was unable to travel to Guyana, but in demonstrating her commitment, she will join us virtually on Friday to discuss Guy Grenada's plan for its green economy transition. The effects of Hurricane Beryl were also felt in Barbados and St. Lucia, and in Jamaica, currently 60% of the island is still without electricity. 
And with this one catastrophic event, we have to ask ourselves some serious questions. Once again, how do we mitigate and adapt to those climatic impacts? How does this affect our ability to feed our people? And how do our Caribbean people exploit opportunities presented by new technologies, innovation, and connectivity to continue to do business in times of peril? That is why, since 2022, Caribbean export has championed these core areas, and it is no different this year. We believe these areas portend the greatest potential for a transformative and resilient Caribbean region. Our agency reaffirms our unwavering commitment to driving investments into these priority areas, which we believe can have the potential to transform our region. And I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes talking a bit about the three priority areas. The first area is our green economy transition. While the Caribbean is renowned for its natural beauty and rich biodiversity, it is increasingly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Rising sea levels, more frequent and intense hurricanes, and changing weather patterns pose significant threats to our ecosystem, economies, and communities. These challenges necessitate an urgent and decisive shift towards greener economies, which is a model that prioritizes sustainability and fosters resilience. Transitioning to green economies, therefore, is not just about mitigating risk, it is also about seizing opportunities. What is not spoken about with this green economy transition is there are potential opportunities for growth of the private sector, jobs, and investment. In a joint report published in 2020 by the ILO and the Inter-American Development Bank, it was estimated that decarbonization will help create approximately 400,000 jobs. In addition, the International Renewable Energy Agency estimates that for every US dollar spent in um, green, every US dollar invested in a green energy transition, an additional 93 cents of GDP growth will occur above the business as usual scenario in the region. These are promising statistics for sure. However, we are faced with the stark reality that a green economy transition is going to cost a lot and it requires significant investment. The AIADB, for example, reports that the region will require approximately $16.1 billion in investment by 2040 if we have to achieve the true potential of a green economy transition. Given these requirements, there's an immediate need to mobilize the right partners, especially in business, that can help support this, request, this requisite infrastructure. This, ladies and gentlemen, is at the core of our rationale for the Caribbean Investment Forum because we know such a transition will not only bolster resilience, but also create jobs and opportunities for many in the region. The second area, innovation and technology, which is fundamental for the integration of the Caribbean private sector into the regional and global economies. The region is witnessing a digital transformation with increasing internet penetration and mobile connectivity. Technologies such as virtual reality, big data, cloud computing are delivering, are delivering new capabilities for businesses which are accelerating product innovation and providing new economies of scale. At Caribbean Export, we see it as our duty to ensure that the private sector is not left behind and we can leverage these opportunities through innovative application of industry 4.0 technologies. And of course, what does it require? Significant investment in innovative infrastructure, in education, in technology adoption, in entrepreneurship, and innovative tech startups. These can unlock new economic potential and create digitally empowered societies. The region's useful population is tech savvy and ready to embrace digital innovations, making it an attractive market for technology investments. With a growing pool of talented professionals and a burgeoning startup ecosystem, member states are positioning themselves as centers for digital innovation. Investments in tech incubators, research institutions, and digital infrastructure can catalyze the development of homegrown solutions and to regional and global challenges. The final area is sustainable agriculture. The Caribbean is blessed with rich biodiversity, fertile soils, and a climate conducive to growing a wide variety of crops. However, hurricanes, droughts, and rising sea levels pose significant threats to our agriculture system and consequently our food security. 
This makes adoption of sustainable agriculture practices not just an option, but a necessity. Further, there is no shortage of research on the importance of food security and necessary actions required to mitigate food insecurity challenges. A key driver of this is the commitment of our region's heads of government to achieve a food reduction in, a reduction in food imports by 25% in the year 2025. And we must commend the Secretary General and her team at CARICOM for spearheading this policy agenda so relentlessly and with the effective follow-up action being undertaken. For us, business and additional investments are critical to achieve this vision. This is especially so given the fact that apart from countries like Belize, the DR and Suriname, and of course, here in Guyana, we simply do not have this acreage to produce the scale required to make us food secure. The answer that we must look to is technology. And as such, we worked with the government of Guyana in 2021 to convene the first ever Agritech Investment Summit spearheaded by President Ali, where investment opportunities in agritech were promoted. Sustainable agriculture in the Caribbean is gaining momentum, particularly with the rise of organic farming. In Jamaica, for instance, there has been substantial growth in its organic farming sector, which expanded by 20% over the past five years. We can only hope that Hurricane Beryl did not set that progress back too far. So I hope I've been able to demonstrate the rationale for the Caribbean Investment Forum and our focus on these three priority areas. So over the next two days, we have a packed agenda and we, we have carefully created an, uh, an agenda to ensure enough time for businesses to engage with others and the presentation of investment projects and opportunities to willing and vetted investors. We have always in, in, intended that the Caribbean Investment Forum would not be a talk shop, but be a space for business to engage and for action to happen. And trust me, I'm aware of the irony of me saying that after a 15 minute long speech. <laughs> you will be treated to thought leadership in the plenary sessions as well as hear from aspiring entrepreneurs as they present their project presentations in addition to the many regional investment promotion agencies that will present their country's value proposition. I also encourage you to visit our investment village and expo and take some time to peruse the event application and schedule meetings with other delegates in our business to business opportunity center. That is where the magic happens. You talking to one another and making business happen. To our partners that have come on board, thank you for supporting our agenda. To our sponsors, including our platinum sponsors, Republic Bank Limited, for the third year in a row, US Agency for International Development, and GoInvest, we appreciate all you bring to the CIF. So as I conclude, let us continue to engage, invest, and collaborate, unlocking the immense potential of the Caribbean. As a region, we need to come together and face these challenges head on and continue to support each other in seeking a sustainable future. Thank you for being part of this remarkable journey and let us move forward with a clear sense of purpose in unity and the unwavering resolve to achieve our shared vision. Together we will build a Caribbean that stands as a beacon of hope, opportunity and progress for all. Thank you all and I wish everyone a successful Caribbean Investment Forum 2024. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinanand, for, of course, reiterating why it is important that we are all here in the room and also why we are actively participating in this year's Caribbean Investment Forum and also for demonstrating just how passionate you are about the work at the Caribbean Export Development Agency. Please, once again, please put your hands together for Dr. Sinanand. Ladies and gentlemen, as we stand on the cusp of a thriving future, the Caribbean Investment Forum presents an opportunity for us to really reflect on the rich tapestry of cooperation and innovation that defines the region. Throughout history, the Caribbean has been a crossroads of culture, a melting pot, if you will, where diverse peoples and ideas converge, forming our collective identity. 
cooperation, born out of necessity and also opportunity, became the cornerstone of our shared existence, resulting in the establishment of the Caribbean community, which has had a significant impact on the region since its inception in 1973. Designed to promote economic integration, coordination of foreign policy, and functional cooperation among its member states, CARICOM has bolstered regional unity and resilience. It has facilitated access to intra-regional trade through initiatives like the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, and it continues to be a pivotal force in shaping the Caribbean's aspirations for a more integrated future by co-signing the vision of initiatives like the Caribbean Investment Forum. Representing the body today is an economist with a distinguished career in regional governance and finance, an advocate for gender equality and sustainable economic policies, and the current Secretary General of CARICOM. Please put your hands together and make her feel welcome this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Carla N. Barnett, Secretary General of CARICOM. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a wonderful day to be here. Let me begin by asking you to agree with me that I can accept protocols having been established and simply say that I would want to congratulate the Caribbean Export Development Agency on staging this event again, bringing together private businesses government officials, regional and international institutions and other stakeholders together for important dialogue on how to promote, support, ensure we invest in areas that are critical to our development. Thanks to the supporting partners without whom this event could not take place. Thanks and congratulations to Dr. Sinan and the new Executive Director of Caribbean Export to whom the CARICOM Secretariat extends full support as he carries out his mandate. This investment forum is being staged at a critical time for the Caribbean community. We have just experienced Hur Hurricane Beryl, a record-breaking system that reached Category 5 status, the earliest we have ever experienced in the Atlantic hurricane season. Beryl has devastated several islands in the region and caused extensive damage to others. Assessments to date record several deaths in CARICOM member states, destruction of infrastructure and severe impacts on sectors, notably fisheries and agriculture. Entire communities still remain without essential infrastructure and services, including electricity, water and communications. CARICOM is again at an inflection point where scarce capital has to be diverted from economic development to support recovery and rebuilding. From the effects of extreme weather events fueled by the global warming that is at the core of climate change. This forum focuses on three critical matters, agriculture and food and nutrition security, green economy transition, and digitalization of businesses. These are matters of great priority in CARICOM. CARICOM's Vision 25 by 2025, led by His Excellency President Irfan Ali of Guyana, prioritizes a private investment to reduce the region's food import bill through increased local production and through enhanced intra-regional trade. The region has been making progress as it implements this pivotal initiative. There have been notable advances in policy development and implementation, in attracting investment, and in de-risking the agricultural sector. Several member states are producing new crops, and functional partnerships have been established with the private sector, farmers, and civil society. Private sector investment in sustainable agriculture is now crucial to bolster advantages and address challenges, especially since Beryl 
has now caused significant setbacks. The objective is to channel investments into sustainable agricultural product, projects that modernize farming, introduce technological innovations, and improve market access for existing and for new agri-products. Importantly, we are prioritizing investments that are climate resilient. Those investments which integrate improved farming techniques to address the region's vulnerability to hurricanes, floods, droughts, and rising sea levels that cause salination and loss of arable lands. To date, our interventions in the region's food and nutrition security have been targeted and deliberate. With regard to de-risking, we are pleased that a regional agri-insurance product has been identified. Work is on the way to find dedicated capital funds for investment opportunities in transportation and logistics, digitization, and research into best practices to develop the sector based on the available science. With the support of the CARICOM private sector organization, we have pinpointed possible investment opportunities amounting to US $1.2 billion, covering six potential agri-food value chain opportunities. These are to produce cereals and staples, beverages, fresh canned and salted fish, vegetables, fruits and nuts, poultry and other meats, and milk and cream. Active partnerships with the private sector and investment in these and other areas will generate new industries and support food and nutrition security for current and future generations. With regard to the green economy transition, we are aware that the Caribbean region depends heavily on imported fuel, aging, power generating infrastructure, and vulnerable electrical grids. Given their status as predominantly net importers of hydrocarbons, member states are at risk of fluctuations in both prices and supply within the global energy commodity markets. These factors contribute to deficient energy security and increase the region's susceptibility to the impacts of climate change. CARICOM has been focusing strategically on the transition to renewable energy in the quest for energy security. Over the past two decades, countries across the region have increasingly embraced renewable energy sources, such as hydro, solar, wind, and geothermal power to diversify their energy mix. Increased results require dedicated partnerships, collaboration, and knowledge sharing among stakeholders, which will identify capacity gaps and promote actions to build green technology subsectors. Investment opportunities include funding the bridges between conventional and sustainable technologies, and for accelerators and incubators to foster the development of green and clean technologies. The CARICOM region has a high percentage of jobs created by micro, small, and medium enterprises. It is estimated that 70% of jobs come from MSMEs, and it is a perennial struggle for many of these businesses to keep their doors open and remain competitive. Digital transformation is essential for increasing competitiveness and can change how companies operate and how they deliver value. Businesses in the region, which are already digitized, may lose some impetus in the aftermath of burial, which significantly damage communication services and power. There is therefore scope for resilient systems that can return to normalcy quickly after extreme weather events and other emergencies. There's also room for investment in technology adoption mechanisms, business information and capacity building platforms, infrastructure development and innovation projects. And whether it is agriculture and food and nutrition security, green economy transition or digitalization of business, there is great scope for increasing the participation of women and youth in new investment projects. The recent fourth United Nations Conference on Small Island Developing States held in Antigua noted that the next 10 years are critical for SIDS. A new context is emerging where the social, economic, environmental, 
and geopolitical threats to the development of small island developing states are so great that they can only meaningfully be managed by way of an invigorated enabling environment. I therefore urge investors, private foundations, innovators, and other stakeholders to intentionally and strategically support the businesses of the region as they seek to meet current and future challenges and realities. The events of the past week and the realization that this is only the beginning of an active Atlantic hurricane season underscore the imperative of urgent and decisive action to effectively address our vulnerabilities. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barnett. Our next speaker is a seasoned European Union diplomat with over 20 years in EU institutions. He began his career in Suriname in 1991, contributing to its first structural adjustment program and currently serves as ambassador and head of the EU delegation to Guyana for Suriname with responsibility for Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, Saba, St. Barthélemy, St. Eustatius, and St. Martin. While his career is punctuated with multiple successes, one of his most impressive accomplishments, in my humble opinion, is summiting Mount Kilimanjaro, a feat that takes on average five to nine days to complete and is not completed by 65% of us who try. <laughs> Clearly, our speaker ha has an understanding of how to go the extra mile to achieve a goal. So please put your hands together for, and give a big round of applause to Ambassador Rene Van Nies. Thank you so much for uh, quite an introduction. Um, Your Excellency, Dr. Mohamed Ivan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, esteemed ministers of the cabinet, Dr. Carla Bennett, Secretary General of CARICOM, uh, Dr. Demi Sinanan, the Executive Director of the Caribbean Development Agency, Lisa Harding, Head of the Private Sector Division of the Caribbean Development Bank, colleagues from the diplomatic community, media representatives, partners, colleagues, and friends of the Caribbean. It is a great honor for me to speak here today at the opening ceremony of the Caribbean Investment Forum. And normally I would be tremendously happy to do that. I'm slightly less happy today because we just lost as the Netherlands in our game against England. I know. You were all rooting for the Netherlands, I appreciate that. <laughs> Allow me to begin by expressing my sincere appreciation to the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for hosting this edition of the Caribbean Investment Forum. And this investment forum, I think, has already uh, started to establish itself as a key event in the year for policymakers and for investors. And I can't imagine a better country than Guyana to exemplify the growth potential of the Caribbean and to serve as an illustration that uh, serious economic growth ambitions and environmental ambitions can indeed go hand in hand. Let me allow, allow me to give a special welcome to participants that come from the countries that have been affected by Hurricane Beryl. And I wish these countries a very fast recovery from the uh, events that have happened. And I think their vulnerability is a very stark reminder that climate change is real and indeed calls for urgent actions. So as the European Union, we're very proud to be an important part of this event through our very close partnership with the Caribbean Export Development Agency. And I would like to use this opportunity today to congratulate the recently appointed new executive director uh, with 
his very ambitious uh, uh, tasks ahead, and I'm sure he will continue to drive the agency forward, building on the strong momentum that was built over the last few years. I'm happy to see many representatives of the Caribbean and of European business community, and as you business people know, the value proposition of a business is a short statement that summarizes why a customer would choose the products or its services. And as the European Union, we also have a value proposition. And that includes democracy, rule of law, human rights, transparency, accountability, freedom, and equality. And President Ali knows how fond I am in emphasizing these values, and I keep mentioning them time and time again. And why is that? Well, because those values run like a thread through everything that the European Union does. It is what makes us different from many other actors in the world. And we recognize in the Caribbean many like-minded partners that share those same norms and values. We enjoy a long-standing partnership with the region founded on shared interest and strong economic, social, cultural, and historical ties. And in this increasingly polarized world, with competing worldviews, knowing each other's value proposition is more important than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to see that more European companies recognize the Caribbean as a significant investment opportunity. And we aspire to be the business partner of choice for the Caribbean. And for that, we are putting at your disposal the comprehensive Global Gateway Strategy and its associated investment agenda. And I hope you have heard about the Global Gateway uh, already, but let me say a few words. So the Global Gateway Investment Agenda, which is something that the EU is rolling out in all the countries where it works worldwide, that is the EU's offer to bridge the investment gap and leverage private capital to boost innovative sustainable and transformative investments. That is indeed a change to the past. Instead of funding, say, a project of 5 million euro, what we will now try and do is invest that 5 million euro and with that try to attract private investments in cooperation with the investment agencies and create a project of, say, 50 million euro. And of course, we don't mind if the investors then come from the European Union. So the EU investment offer is substantial. It combines hard infrastructure investments, but also flanking measures. For example, the regulatory framework, improving business and investment environments, developing human capital, and building more secure global supply chains. In short, investments that are good for profit but also good for the people and for the planet. And through this Global Gateway Investment Agenda, the Caribbean region has access to a broad range of EU um, instruments and tools, especially in the sectors climate and energy, health, digital, trans uh, digital transformation, education and research. And I would like to give you a, a few short examples. The first is the digital sector. I mean, here we know that the digital transformation is now a matter of participate or perish. And so it's really important that everyone is part of that. The EU offers the EU Luck Digital Alliance. And here I'm very happy to share the news that Guyana has decided to join the Digital Alliance. And thereby, Guyana joins over 20 other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean in this highly relevant and voluntary partnership. And the EU is very proud to um, present the Bella Cable that connects Europe to Latin America. But the Digital Alliance is much more than only a physical infrastructure. It is indeed about people. Digitalization only contributes to the creation of welfare when there are guarantees for the safe use of data and when privacy of people and entrepreneurs is protected and when transparency and accountability is guaranteed. And so within 
the Digital Alliance, we will have instruments like the Digital Accelerator, and colleagues are here to tell you more about that during the forum. There is a cybersecurity training center to provide training and advice on this very threat of cybersecurity. And the EU will make available its satellite imagery uh, uh, images, and they make that available free of charge to all private and public entities. But most of all, the Digital Alliance is a place for those that participate to talk to, the, uh, to each other and to exchange their experiences on what it is to go through this digital transition. So to those Caribbean countries that have not yet joined the eu LAC Digital Alliance, please consider doing so and make the best of the opportunities that are being offered. Ladies and gentlemen, you probably know that the EU is the only continent that has committed to become climate neutral by 2050. And that indeed is an incredibly ambitious target. It will change the way we live, the way we work, the way we eat, the way we move, the way we go on holiday. But it makes no sense to tackle a global problem in one region only. So therefore, the EU has extensive programs to promote climate adaptation and mitigation measures worldwide. And these programs include specialized technical assistance, direct investments in renewable energy, but the EU is also one of the region's main partners when it comes to innovative climate finance solutions, such as the development of green and blue bond markets. And we will very soon launch the EU Global Green Bond Initiative. I had to look that one up myself. Uh, but that is a facility that will make sure that money will flow from private capital, uh, from uh, institutional investors into climate and environmental projects in partner countries, including the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, it's impossible to think of economic development in the Caribbean without mentioning connectivity and the transport sector. Regional integration and connecting countries and regions and territories is in the DNA of the European Union as we have the world's highest density of transport networks. Among other things, we have set up an investment window with the Caribbean Development Bank to improve maritime connectivity in order to foster regional integration and to promote economic growth. And we are in discussion with a wide range of actors to make sure that transport options for cargo and passenger traffic can be increased in the near future. I could tell you a lot more about EU partnerships on health and on education, but I can see that I will not have the time to do that. Allow me to mention one initiative that I'm very proud of, and that is the agreement between Guyana, Barbados, and Rwanda to promote the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. So in Rwanda, they were able to successfully build a mRNA vaccine manufacturing facility, and it opened in December 2023. And that was made possible because the European Union provided expertise to put the uh, regulatory framework in place. And exactly those same experts that advised Rwanda are now advising Guyana in putting the regulatory framework in place. And I think that is a beautiful example of South-South cooperation, about solidarity within the Caribbean region with this very close working relation uh, between Guyana and Barbados, but it's also an illustration of that global gateway that I mentioned earlier, as it is using EU grant money to pave the way for private investments. Ladies and gentlemen, with the energy that we see here at the Caribbean Investment Forum, you're well placed to capitalize on the benefits of the economic partnership agreements between the CARI Forum and the EU. And as you know, the EPA offers duty-free and quota-free access of Caribbean goods and services into the European single market. And that is a market of more than 450 million consumers 
with a huge appetite for healthy ecological products. And my colleagues that are here are very happy to share more about the benefits of the economic partnership agreement during the forum. The Caribbean is known for its famous ABC. Always sunny, beautiful beaches and nature, and of course cricket. But it's so much more than that. The Caribbean have a vibrant business community, a young and energetic population, a strategic geographical location, and a wide range of opportunities and bankable projects. I could write a whole alphabet about the Caribbean. I will not do that, because I'm aware that the philosophy of the Caribbean Investment Forum is less talk and more business, and therefore I will not extend myself more in this welcome. Thank you so much, and I wish you a very successful Caribbean Investment Forum 2024. Thank you so much, Ambassador Van Nee. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my fervent hope that as you listen to the partners for the Caribbean Investment Forum 2024, that your excitement is building, your anticipation for what's to come is growing, and you are seriously thinking about either establishing or maximizing your presence here in the Caribbean. As was previously noted by Dr. Sinanan, this year's conference, uh, Caribbean Investment Forum, aims to attract investment by focusing on sectors that fast track the Caribbean's transition to a greener and smarter economy. It also aims to promote the Caribbean as a prime investment destination and to foster connection between investors and businesses to create new opportunities and to help the Caribbean Export Development Agency and its partners achieve these objectives, we have, of course, invited industry leaders to share their knowledge with us over the next two days. Tomorrow, our day two of the Caribbean Investment Forum will begin with a keynote fireside chat focusing on building tomorrow, harnessing the power of green, and we'll continue with a CEO leadership roundtable that will focus on Caribbean Titans Unite, how we can fuel resilience through bold investments. There will be a panel discussion following focused on fields of fortune, investing in sustainable agriculture for a flourishing Caribbean. There will also be a special remark presented by Lorena Salazano Salazar, who is a representative from the Inter-American Development Bank. There will also be a keynote address on building resilience through de-risking, unleashing the catalytic capital and public-private collaborations in the Caribbean, which will be presented by Isobel Coleman, Deputy Administrator for Policy and Programming. Tomorrow, as we head into the afternoon, there will be the official opening of the Caribbean Investment Forum 2024 Investment Village and Press Conference, followed by the Investment Project Presentations, Carib Equity Presentation, and UNCDF Presentation. As you would have heard this year, we are, of course, focusing on several key investments sectors, including sustainable agriculture, green economy transition, and digital innovation. And in the true spirit of embracing digital technology, we want to encourage you to download the Hoover app. It will only take about 30 minutes or so. Simply head over to the Play Store and download the Hoover app. It is a critical tool to helping the Caribbean Investment Forum and its partners understand how well we have met this year's objectives. So if you head over to the Play Store, you are looking for the WHOVA app. Hoover. Thank you so much if you've already downloaded the app, and we look forward to a day full of interesting dialogue tomorrow. As the leading catalyst for development resources in the Caribbean, the Caribbean Development Bank is dedicated to the systematic reduction of poverty through social and economic development. At this juncture, we are honored to invite Head of Private Sector at the Caribbean Development Bank, Ms. Lisa Harding. She's coming to offer remarks at this time. Please put your hands together for her.
Your Excellency Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Republic of Guyana, Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General CARICOM, His Excellency Rene Van Ness, Ambassador Delegation of the European Union to Guyana, with Dr. Demi Sinanan, Executive Director of Caribbean Export Development Agency, Go Caribbean government ministers, officials, investors, bankers, welcome. On behalf of the President of the Caribbean Development Bank, it is a privilege to extend a warm welcome to all distinguished guests, delegates, and participants gathered here for the opening of the 2024 Caribbean Investment Forum here in Georgetown. At the very onset, I wish to commend Caribbean Export for their vision in conceptualizing such an important regional forum. CDB endorsed this initiative from the inception, as you would have heard Demi mentioned earlier, and we recall with great fond memories the first forum which was held in Trinidad. We recognize that the Caribbean Investment Forum really provided an opportunity and filled the void and served as a strategic platform to not only showcase investment opportunities, but to facilitate necessary networking and partnerships and foster much needed dialogue among stakeholders. We are also happy to acknowledge that the Caribbean Investment Forum has successfully attracted investment capital into the region. I also wish to recognize the key, our key partners, the Government of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, the European Union, CARICOM, and our platinum sponsors, Republic Bank, USAID, the Guyana Office of Investment, and other sponsors who came together to make this event a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, this, after, this evening, I have three simple messages to share. The first is, the Caribbean is open to investment. The Caribbean, as many of you would be aware, has been working actively to improve its investment profile in recent years, aiming to attract more foreign direct investment and bolster economic development. You would have seen and witnessed a focus on increased in incentives and business climate reforms to make the region more competitive for investment. Many of you would also bear witness to the diversification strategies by our countries, where there are now new and increasing opportunities for investment in new areas, including renewable energy, climate smart agriculture, manufacturing, the creative industries, and of course, information technology. There have also been improvements in connectivity. Um, Ambassador Van Ness just spoke about this, not only in terms of physical networks, in terms of transportation networks, the you know, emergence of um, ferry operations, but also in terms of digital connectivity with a focus on broadband infrastructure. And this, of course, leads me into my second message, which is really the private sector has to be a key partner in the sustainable development of the region. Because while the region, the Caribbean, is open to investment, I believe that we can also agree that the Caribbean is, is experiencing increasing instances of natural disasters and other hazards, mainly attributed to climate change. The cost to meet these demands for increased resili resilience efforts, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation, and of course recovery and rebuilding in the aftermath are enormous. It has been estimated in this regard that the region requires 65 billion by 2030 to meet the cost of critical infrastructure, such as transportation networks, energy facilities, water and sanitation systems, and of course, telecommunications. The limited fiscal space of national governments, coupled with dwindling concessional resources from the international donor community, signals the urgent need to mobilize and leverage private capital for development outcomes. In this regard, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals has also identified the private sector as a main partner for sustainable development. And this, of course, leads me to my final message, which is really that the CDB partnerships matter. The CDB plays a critical role in supporting investment and sustainable development across its client countries. We take a holistic view of development, ensuring that it is resilient, inclusive, and equitable. We continue to promote private sector development by providing loans, equity investments, and technical assistance to small and medium-sized enterprises and other private sector entities. We also prioritize investments in climate resilience. This includes funding for infrastructure projects that improve resilience to hurricanes, floods, and other climate-related risks 
such as seawall and coastal defenses, early warning systems, and climate smart agriculture. We also focus on projects which address the growing energy insecurity in the region. In terms of social services, the bank supports investments in social inf infrastructure, including education and health care. And we promote regional integration and cooperation among our client countries through investments in regional infrastructure projects, trade facilitation, and policy harmonization all of which is necessary to foster economic integration and create a more unified market within the Caribbean region. But we cannot do it alone, so partnerships do indeed matter. It is no secret that the CDB shares the view that accelerated sustainable development requires a partnership for development ethos between private and public sectors and civil society. This requires purposeful objectives with minimum policy uncertainty and coordinated mechanisms for ensuring the complementarity of efforts. CDB stands ready to work with regional governments to make sure that the enabling environment is right so that businesses can flourish, innovation can grow, the green transition is smooth, and Caribbean citizens can thrive. We are here to provide technical advice and leverage financial support, both bilateral and multilateral, to bring resources to the table. We are also positioning ourselves to fund targeted private sector projects with development impact through co-financing and supporting innovative financial instruments such as regional fund of funds. In closing, it is my hope that this event will continue to position Guyana and the Caribbean as an attractive business destination reinforce that the Caribbean is indeed open for investment and mobilize much needed investment in key sectors. I trust that over the next three days, the forum will also create a space to establish and or deepen strategic relationships between potential investors, policymakers, the private sector, and other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's keep that applause going for Ms. Lita, Lisa Harding, Head of Private Sector Division at the Caribbean Development Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our feature address. And at this moment, it brings me great honor to introduce the person who will introduce our feature speaker for this afternoon. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Peter Ramsarup, who's been appointed by President Dr. Irfan Ali of Guyana in October 2020, to serve as Guyana's Chief Investment Officer to join me at the lectern to, of course, welcome His Excellency. I have to stop right there because I have to introduce someone who doesn't like to be introduced. But when you listen to His Excellency's speech next, I just want you to think through of a Fortune company. Would have you be, if you were buying a stock in a Fortune 500 company, be looking at their leadership, vision, their strategy? Do they have a measurable plan? Could they deliver on the dividends? And what we have as a president in Guyana is all of that. What is his measurement of success when he talks about both Guyana and the region? It's one, especially for us as Guyanese, is the measurement and the index of prosperity and wealth growth for every Guyana. And that's why you see when you drive around our country, you see this one Guyana sign. So when you listen to him speak today, follow the money. Follow how he speaks about the investment opportunities. Follow how you would measure it. And ultimately, how do you answer where do you fit being in attendance of this conference? With that, I'd like to introduce my president, Dr. Irfan Ali. Thank you, Thank you very much, please. Distinguish members of the cabinet, members of the diplomatic community, members of the private sector, members of the media, all, good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. This is an investment forum. Uh, and someone said it's a forum filled with energy. That good afternoon was not too energetic. <laughs> but let me say to all of you how very pleased I am as president of Guyana to welcome you to this very important event. I want to welcome you to a country that has 18 million hectares of pristine forests that contains the world's most unique biodiversity. A country that is one of eight jurisdictions comprising the Amazon Basin. A country with 85% forest coverage. A country with the lowest deforestation rate in the world. And a country with the second highest forest cover percentage to land cover in the world. Welcome to Guyana. A country that is committed to ensuring that climate services, biodiversity services, and ecological services are part of the economic transformation that will take place here. Today I had the opportunity of being with leaders in academia from the private sector, former presidents and environmental ministers at Concordia in Baganara, in Guyana. And at that forum, not only did I reinforce our commitment to the 30 percent by 2030 pledge of global leaders in relation to a percentage of areas that will be considered protected areas for biodiversity. But I made it very clear that Guyana intends to take the leadership role on mobilizing friends and countries with rich biodiversity into a global coalition or a global alliance on biodiversity and to commence the work on creating the model, a, model, a scalable model that will address forests and biodiversity together. So in this model, that we discussed in Baganara just a few hours ago. We have committed with Concordia to work in bringing together the stakeholders, the leaders of at least 17 countries, members of the academic community, so that we can work together in creating this model on biodiversity to develop a pricing mechanism on the model and to launch this model globally. Now, this is also an important part of the LCDS. And we are one country with tremendous we are one country with tremendous experience in developing successful models. The most successful model on forests was developed by Guyana, and today Guyana is presenting global leadership on forests. In this model, we saw between 2020 and 2024, in just three and a half years, 
of strong leadership where we launched the LCDS 2030. We saw the issuance of the first jurisdictional scale carbon credit in the world of 33.4 million tons to Guyana under the R3 program. First, we saw the forest scale agreement of forest carbon credit sale for US, 700 <coughs> US $750 million over 10 years with Hess Corporation. We saw Ghana receiving US $150 million to date in carbon credit payment for investment in low carbon programs at national and community levels. We have also committed, as promised in the LCDS 2030, and delivered on allocating 15% of all revenues from the LCDS to Amerindian communities and villages across the country, across the country, the first in the world. First. There is no other jurisdiction globally that has such a mechanism for its indigenous population. We are the first. We can demonstrate how models work. And we are going to demonstrate how a model on biodiversity can work. I say this to make this point at this conference. Sometimes we are captured by our own size, size of population and size of market. But there is nothing bigger than an idea, than innovation, than driving ideas that can change the narrative and position us as a region of excellence. And that is what we have to do. We have to go after innovation that will position us as a region of excellence. And a region of excellence requires innovative thinking. It requires investing in the knowledge economy, investing in our human resources, building the right and strong partnership. These are the things that matter. So today, I'm very pleased that we have started the work on establishing the Global Bi Biodiversity Alliance. We are going to set the narrative on creating the benchmark for biodiversity, creating a framework and working model on valuing biodiversity, making economic assessment of biodiversity held by the biodiversity superpowers of the world, develop biodiversity financing mechanism, and of course, Guyana has offered and is willing to be the hub of this effort. So I wanted to start my presentation by giving you an example of one innovative approach we took hours ago on something that we feel strongly about, that is our forests and our biodiversity. There is no sacrificing of the value of our forests and the value of, its, of our biodiversity in the economic strategy for transformation. We are creating a model through which our success in oil and gas and our success in forests and biodiversity can be blended to create a balanced platform of growth and development. Having said that, I wish now to turn my attention to the forum at hand. <clears throat> now, it's important for us at this forum <coughs> to understand a few things. We have to be very frank, and we have to examine ourselves critically as a region. My friend from the CDB spoke a bit earlier. It would be interesting for us to learn about the liquidity that exists in the private sector arm of the CDB. How have we grown that liquidity over the last 10 years? 
How did we invest that liquidity over the last 10 years? How did we create innovative approach of bringing the region and private sector together to make use of that liquidity? And then, maybe for us to self-examine the total deposits in commercial banks in CARICOM countries that is estimated to be 61.5 billion US dollars. The total deposits, 61.5 billion dollars sitting in deposits in the banks. How are we leveraging that capital? How are we using that capital to create new wealth? These are questions for the financial sector, for Regional Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, and for the private sector to answer for us. I heard my friend speak about small islands and limited arable lands to pursue the agricultural initiatives. But my friend did not say that Suriname offered 75,000 hectares of land to the private sector of this region to invest in agriculture and food production. It will be interesting to hear how much of that land has been taken up. SG, you have a report? <laughs> 75,000 hectares of land offered to the private sector. What did we do? How did we make use of this opportunity? More than a decade ago, or a decade and a half ago, under the Jack Dale Initiative on Agriculture, we offered 25,000 hectares of land for regional investors with capital to come and deploy it to the land. We had zero take up. That very land today, three years ago, we said in this country, we are going to become self-sufficient in grains and create all the backward and forward linkages for feed production and, great, and be, becoming a net exporter of grains by 2026. Many doubted it. Today, we are on the verge of becoming fully self-sufficient self for corn, soya, and by 2026, we'll be exporting. We will also be using that grain to create the forward and backward linkages in producing the, food, the feed right here. That will save us more than 30 million US dollars of import every year. That is foreign currency saving. So these are some of the realities I just wanted to address. Not to be harsh, but to be factual, to be open, as we discuss the way in which we're going to build this region, build capacity and capability in the region. I want us to turn our attention to a few important stats. Now, this region we are committed as anyone else to achieving the SDGs. And I wanted us to examine from a private sector perspective, from a development perspective, we have the EU, we have USAID, we have the Canadians, we have all the players in the room. <coughs> this is a scenario before us in terms of investment gap in the region. An annual average investment of US $373 billion is required, just under water and sanitation. New infrastructure requires an allocation of US $256 billion, $90.6 billion to improve access to safe drinking water, $148 billion towards improving access to safe safely managed sanitation, and 16.8 billion in sewer treatment. 
This is investment that is required for us to achieve important SDG goals. This is a financing gap as it is now. How do we mobilize capital? What opportunity this brings for public-private partnership, for developing models that can work in the interest of achieving the SDGs, but also can be profitable for the private sector. The days when we look at these things as investment only by the state is coming closely to an end. We have to deploy private capital. We have to deploy private capital and find the best model in deploying that capital to meet these financing gaps. If you look at the investment gap in the region in terms of electricity, we're talking about renewables. But let's look at what it, take, what it will take to achieve the goals that we have set ourselves. To provide universal access to electricity and to begin the decarbonization of electricity generation mix, it requires $577 billion. And this is before Hurricane Beryl, long before. $577 billion. Of this amount, new infrastructure requires an allocation of $396 billion, of which $371 billion is required for generation and transmission. Right here in Guyana, we have a transmission system that is age, totally incapable of meeting the needs and demands of the country. Our generating capacity is not close to what is required to fulfill the imminent demand that is growing exponentially every single day. And we have not even implemented the promise of reducing the costs of energy electricity by 50%. When we reduce that, you can imagine everyone coming back on the grid and the competitive advantage it will give Guyana in manufacturing and industrial development, and that by itself will create greater and new demand. So this is what exists on electricity. In transportation, Building the new needed infrastructure for roads, airports, and public transportation would necessitate an annual investment of $976 billion. Of this among the region should allocate $548 billion to the construction of new roads, sorry, $310 billion to the construction of new roads, 15.2 billion for airport and urban mass transit infrastructure, 222.4 billion dollars. The remaining US, 427 billion dollars is to maintain and replace existing infrastructure. The investment gap in telecommunication Boosting residential connectivity with fixed broadband and 4G mobile internet technology would require an average annual investment of $293 billion of GDP, or 0.4% of GDP, through to, through to 2030. These are the investment gap. So when we talk about digitization, when we talk about innovation, when we, when we talk about creating an innovative platform, when we talk about uh, digitizing health records, when we talk about creating data centers, this is the reality. This is the gap that confronts us. If we are not able to bridge this gap, how are we going to create a competitive environment for telecommunication? So those are some of the gaps, the funding gaps that I wanted to highlight. Before I go into 
some opportunities that exist here in Guyana. I mean, you're in Guyana. I, I will be failing in my duty if I do not look at some of the opportunity that exists here. But there are a few, there are a few things that are going in our favor, save and accept some period of instability. Haiti just went through, or is still going through such a period. Four years ago, we went through a period of five months. But there's a few things that work in our favor. And we have to guide these things closely. We have to guide these things closely and ensure we build on it. Political stability. Political stability is a good indicator for our region. But this can shift very quickly. Crime, rising crime, can cause shift in political stability. The rule of law, policy predictability, and this is an important issue. Can investors trust us in terms of our policy? Can they trust our approach to growth and development? Can they trust our modeling? Or are we sending mixed messages as a region as to what our development model is? And sometimes mixed messages on our development model can really affect flow of investment. We have to continue to protect our financial system, building robust financial system, leveraging the capital that is already in the system, building regional partnership. We have to move away from operating in silos and build more regional partnership. The digitization and being ahead of time in relation to digitization is one such platform. In my humble opinion, as a region, we have to develop a common platform on digitization, financial services and financial integrity, leveraging our comparative advantage. Here in Guyana, for example, we are looking at value creation and value addition. Development, for example, of prefab homes. So we have to look at how we create high yielding output and opportunities that answer the issue of resilience and sustainability, that are high yielding in terms of revenue generation, that deploys technology at scale. What 10 acres of land can give you in production? One hydroponic house on an acre of land will give you the same level of production. It is how we deploy the technology, how we deploy knowledge that is going to make the difference in terms of our viability, resilience, and comparative advantage. I'll give you an example. The first gas to shore pipeline that we are working on here in Guyana Almost most of that is going to energy production, a new power plant. But having said that, the remaining will have to go to a second power plant because of the speed of growth and development and what we see will take place. However, we went ahead on an expression of interest to look at new opportunities for a new project, gas project. And between Guyana and Suriname, we have 1.5 billion tons of bauxite. With energy from natural gas, it now makes an aluminum plant very viable here in Guyana. But Guyana and Suriname must now work together to deploy this asset in value addition and value creation. And these are the opportunities that uh, we are looking at. So I wish now to look at some specific strategies that we are deploying in Guyana in our development trajectory. 
At the center of all of this development is human transformation. Everything we do must involve people at the center. So whatever we do, how we build out the sectors, how we invest in the sector, requires us to bring the human resources up with that development, developing their skill set, deploying new knowledge, upgrading skills. So in a human transformation, we have our overall education system, which involves investment to overhaul the education system through the construction of schools and expansion of new ones. Smart classrooms, deploying technology at scale. We want to convert our education system, having smart classrooms in every school, having 100% of our teachers becoming trained graduate teachers, having uh, digitization in our education system so that children can be in a continuous learning environment, online school. Improving attendance and performance, this is another important aspect, reducing dropout, creating the incentive and mechanism through which we improve attendance and performance. Ensuring accessibility to advanced education, technical education, skills development. And importantly, creating a world-class national training center for skills development and skills upgrade. And that center has already been created. The next aspect of this transformation <coughs> is our infrastructure transformation. The complete overhaul of our infrastructure, urban road construction, new bridges, and I'm just giving you some examples of some of the projects that are ongoing already in the pipeline. New highways, and we are working with President Lula and Brazil on the continuation of this highway that would link northern Brazil with Guyana and also bring with it a deep water port. These are investment opportunities that are there. The upgrading of existing roads and highways, expansion of those highways, the building of a new quarantine bridge, and a deep water port to support the economic diversification and transformation and the greater integration of the region. Economic transformation. In the area of economic transformation, we are diversifying the economic base of the country. We want Guyana to be, by 2030, the world leader on energy, the world leader on climate, the world leader on food security, and to develop a country in whose economy reside the most skilled workforce. These are the ambitions that we have set ourselves. Robust economic growth, developing a non-oil economic growth model and pathway to ensure that the headlines of being one of the fastest growing economies in the world is translated into one of the fastest people development center strategy in the world. Where as the country grow, the people of this country and the people of the region, let me pause to reinforce this point. Everything we're investing in in this country is ultimately to serve the people of this region. The capacity that we are building and the investment that we are making in health, in education, in security, in transport transportation, in agriculture, all of this will be deployed to serve the people of this region. We want the people of this region to enjoy the growth and prosperity of Guyana. That is an important part of what we are doing. So we want to have, with the growth of the economy, the growth and improvement in the quality of life of the people of Guyana and the region. We must have access to the best possible health care, best possible education, infrastructure, social services. And this will bring with it greater competition and opportunities. As I said before, 
In another few years, our salary structure will be comparable to many jurisdictions that our teachers, our nurses went, and they will want to return. And then it will become more competitive to enter uh, different jobs. For that reason, those who are already in jobs must use this opportunity to continuously upgrade themselves and make personal progress and personal achievement. The Gas Assure project is another important part. Financial transformation. I want to say and I want to commend the IDB Invest. There are a lot of myths out there about how fast the IDB Invest can work. The IDB Invest has been a strong partner with us and I want to commend them. The speed at which the IDB Invest is working and energizing the private sector, I think uh, is noteworthy and I want to acknowledge that. We have many projects that are approved by IDB Invest from the private sector, many projects in the pipeline, and many projects that are coming to the pipeline. And I think IDB has read the script well, because the focus by IDB Invest now is on this private sector window, and how the IDB Invest can be the catalyst of growth and development, utilizing the framework and the enabling environment the government is creating for private sector investment. And I think it is this integration that is bringing tremendous success in this model. We also have to ensure with the speed of growth and development that our financial architecture, legislations are intact to avoid financial crimes and to ensure we protect our financial system. That is why we are looking at the amendment of the Financial Institutions Act, making it more fit for purpose, more relevant, up to date. We have had tremendous investment in the support for small businesses, housing incentives to create home ownership at the family level, at the community level, but more importantly, educating the low income earners on how they can de deploy a subsidized home or housing opportunity to raise capital for themselves and becoming entrepreneurs themselves. And this is a model that has brought tremendous success, where we have low-income earners acquiring uh, asset value of 13, well, 75,000 US dollars at 30,000 US dollars, then maximizing that value and deploying the additional capital to acquire a vehicle which they use for a taxi or using that money to open some small business. And this is how you translate the housing program into wealth creation, and that is what is taking place in the country. All across the new housing areas, you are seeing low-income homes being transformed rapidly into middle-income homes because those individuals were able to deploy the net asset value of those homes into business opportunity, creating new wealth and opportunity for themselves. We're looking at a national payment system, improve access to finance, and the development of strategic revolving fund to support new areas of growth and development. Climate transformation is another important area of investment and opportunity. We have the Art Issue Tree Carbon Credit. We have a clear strategy on climate adaptation using the revenue earned from the carbon sale for climate adaptation. We are committed to a low carbon pathway to growth and development. And we have perhaps now one of the best forest management system globally. Why invest in Guyana? It's the fastest growing economy, ideal location to access global markets, resource rich, 
fiscal incentives for investment, multi-sector opportunities, private sector focused government. The government that I lead is tasked with creating the enabling environment for the growth of the private sector. Low operation costs, diverse culture and heritage, and a highly investment to create a highly skilled workforce. The economic takeoff. Ghana is not hedging its future on oil. We are modernizing and investing in all our traditional sectors and new sectors to make these sectors more competitive and to ensure that these sectors can be successful. As a result, if you look at the growth profile of the country, you will see every sector has achieved significant growth over the last two years. And we are ensuring that we build the viability of, including the sugar sector, build the viability of the sugar sector, which required tremendous investment. But we are very confident that Guyana will be in a position in another two years to satisfy the full sugar requirements of this region. The Caribbean single economy, we are part of that. We are part of the Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery Act, Caribbean Canada Trade Agreement, CARI Forum, Guyana-Brazil Partial Scope Agreement, the CARICOM United States Trade and Investment Framework Agreement, Growth in the Americas, MOU, and Marcosur. All of these bodies that we are part of offers unique opportunities to access new market with certain preferential treatment. The investment climate. Ghana is open to investment and has a very friendly investment environment. Ghana offers generous and favorable fiscal investment incentives. Ghana has an open foreign currency market, low inflation, and a stable financial system. Investors are permitted the unbridled repatriation of their profits. Ease of doing business. Recently, we launched the first single window building construction platform. The system was bureaucratic. It had leakages. It was too subject to human biases and human interference. And we decided that we were going to work on a single window approval system. Two weeks ago, we launched the single window approval system. That is system-based that is rule-based, and that hold stakeholders accountable. If technicians do not give responses within a certain time frame, your project is deemed approved. It holds people accountable. And that is what we want all the new systems to do, hold people accountable. There must be traceability. There must be traceability of everything we do. So we're going to continue on this journey of creating a single window electronic system through which government business will be conducted. This, of course, will improve connectivity between the citizens, investors, and other stakeholders. There are numerous investment opportunities and I'm not going to go through it, but in every single sector, we have outlined to you the investment opportunities that exist here in Ghana. As you can see, it's a diversified portfolio. Energy, wind, hydro, solar, waste to energy operation, agriculture, forestry, manufacturing, mining, services, tourism, housing. But we do have challenges that we must confront. But in all of these challenges, we are developing strategies to overcome. Climate change, let me address this. One FPSO sequester about two million tons of carbon. 
10 FPSO will sequester 20 million tons of carbon annually. Our forests sequester annually more than 155 million tons of carbon. What that tells you, even at operating at full capacity, we will not be carbon neutral, Ambassador. We'll be negative. Even operating at full capacity. But there is a bigger story. By 2050, the world will still need energy from petroleum products or petroleum. The scale of that energy that comes from petroleum might be different from what it is today. But who will determine who produced that energy, that petroleum, even if it's 20% of the world energy requirement from petroleum or 30%? Who determined who produced that 30%? And if the problem is climate, as we all agree, then it is who can, who can produce it in the least environmentally damaging environment, and who will be leading the poll? So we are thinking far ahead. We have a clear strategy. That is why it's important for us to keep the forests and keep our biodiversity, because that's an important game changer in the economic modeling that we are pursuing. The Russia-Ukraine conflict and emerging conflicts. This war on Ukraine, which we all know is senseless, we support the territorial integrity and sovereignty of every state, has caused tremendous difficulties for us in this region. Inflation. What is happening with Hamas and Israel? We are far away. But guess what? The cost of a container has increased from $4,000 to $19,000 as a result of what is happening there. So while the conflict is ongoing there, these are the effects and impact that we feel here. 4,000 to 19,000. Imagine the impact on the small economies in this region. The high cost of energy, we're addressing this because this energy cost in the country will be slashed by half shortly. The high dependence on food imports, we're investing to create the environment for a regional food hub here in Guyana an investment in agro-processing and agro-product so that we can cut the cost of this import. The macro response mechanism, establish a regional food hub, national and regional coordination, strategic investment, strong policies into regional agricultural food trade are some of the initiatives that we're taking. So the glass is half full and not half empty. But it's up to us to be bold, to be innovative, to be practical, to embrace the right policies, to support democracy and the rule of law, to support the freedom of people, and to work towards ensuring that the common economic space we want to create with free movement of people is achieved by the next CARICOM heads meeting. These are the things that would ensure our viability and competitiveness. I thank you and God bless you. We extend profound gratitude to His Excellency for that compelling feature address. We'd like to take this time to invite Dr. Demi Sinanan, Dr. Carla Barnett, Ambassador Renee Van Nees, and Ms. Lisa Harding to join His Excellency for a brief photo opportunity. Everyone else, you may be seated as we get ready to culminate our formal program this afternoon at the, against the branded backdrop.
Um. Thank you so much to our partners and stakeholders for your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Riverside Dancers, Jolo and Burbese, the Delight Dance Troupe have collaborated to share a piece of Guyanese culture with you. This is the One Guyana Fusion Dance. Please put your hands together for them. Bire mazak wurut nogong, morowia kok manoro tijik ningai. Give her 
a standing ovation This great nation And show the gem of this world Yeah, 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 Riverside dancers, Joel and Barbie's dance troupe lady, and ladies and gentlemen, with the One Guyana Fusion Dance. Please put your hands together once again for them if you truly enjoyed that choreography, culminating today's formal opening ceremony. And as One Guyana, we officially welcome you to our homeland and to the 2024 Caribbean Investment Forum. As we look forward, we see a Caribbean that is poised to thrive. But of course, our journey is just beginning. That spirit of cooperation that has defined us for centuries must continue to guide us as we capitalize on present opportunities to unlock even greater economic possibilities prosperity in the Caribbean region. We thank you once again for joining us and for being an attentive audience, and we look forward to seeing you at 9 a.m. tomorrow for day two of the Caribbean Investment Forum as we continue to explore avenues for transforming our future and empowering our growth. Subsequent to two His Excellency's exit, we will invite you to enjoy the cocktail reception and cultural presentation in the ground floor foyer. Thank you so much. I'm Nuriye Gerard, Guyana's Media Maven. Do have an enjoyable evening.